Olá pessoal, tudo bem? Welcome to Brazil Crypto Report, where we talk to the builders, entrepreneurs, and influencers from across the Brazil crypto ecosystem. Uh, I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined again by my co-host, Antonio Neto. Great to have you back, Antonio. How are you doing? Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me back. A great uh, opportunity to discuss the upcoming, oh, sorry, the, the last news uh, on the US. Um, and glad amazing. to be here with these um, amazing people. Awesome. Awesome. So normally we try to keep this podcast like pretty focused on Brazil specifically, but we've got so much news in the U.S. just spilling over right now that's really impacting the whole market globally. So uh, right now we want to bring in some voices from the U.S. who can kind of help us interpret everything that's going on and um, then kind of tie in like how does this all uh, uh, impact uh, companies and investors and entrepreneurs overseas? How should all these folks be processing everything here? So um, with that, I'd like to welcome uh, two of our special guests for today. We have Lewis Cohen and Nicholas Day. So Lewis is the, the co-founder of DLX Law, and uh, he's, he's regarded as one of the top crypto lawyers in the U.S. For, for many years now. He's also married to a Brazilian, so a very good choice there, Lewis. And then uh, Nick is also a former colleague of mine at Coindesk, and he's been covering crypto regulation and policy in the U.S. now for several years. Um, so Lewis and Nick have, have both been like really trusted and respected voices in the space for some time now. So we're very fortunate to have them both on. Um, and um, with that, um, yeah, Lewis and Nick, I'd like to just welcome you both. Um, and thanks for being here. And um, maybe, um, Nick, do you want to maybe just kick us off with like a bit of a rundown of just what's happened in the last week here? We've had just the blitzkrieg of news uh, but maybe just kind of give us like the 30,000 foot flyover of what's been happening. Yeah, absolutely, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Um, so at the time of recording, it is currently Wednesday, June 12th, uh, June 14th, excuse me. That shows you how much is happening. Can't you remember the day? Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So on Monday, June 5th, so about a week and a half ago, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission filed a lawsuit against Binance, Binance U.S., and Binance's founder, Shengpen CZ Zhao. Um, the lawsuit, on the base of it, alleged that Binance US was offering unregistered securities in the form of certain cryptocurrencies to US customers, that Binance, the global exchange, was likewise allowing US customers to access uh, cryptocurrencies that the SEC saw as securities. And uh, more than that, they alleged that CZ and Binance were able to access US customer funds, move things around, uh, you know, hide funds, uh, alleged that some, you know, companies tied to ZZ had taken funds from U.S. customers or U.S. customer accounts and later bought yachts, possibly with the same funds. It was implied, not outright stated, but basically alleging some, you know, pretty serious, you know, allegations of wrongdoing. Um, the SEC followed that up a day later by suing U.S. crypto uh, exchange Coinbase, saying that it was also operating as an unregistered securities platform, uh, as an exchange, as a broker, and as a clearinghouse. And I'm sure Lewis can get more into you know the significance of those three distinctions. Uh, but basically, saying that Coinbase, like Binance, was offering unregistered securities to U.S. customers. Although the Coinbase suit did not have any of the other allegations about commingling funds or uh, you know moving U.S. customer funds offshore or anything like that. The SEC also followed that up. It was either on Tuesday or Wednesday. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure at this point. But it filed for a temporary restra uh, restraining order against Binance US, uh, saying that the details of its lawsuit against Binance and Binance US were so severe that it wanted to freeze all of Binance US's assets, uh, allow customers to withdraw funds, but allow no other movements of funds, make sure that Binance US uh, couldn't, you know, for example, move further funds offshore, make sure that Binance itself and CZ couldn't access any Binance US funds. And basically wanted to freeze this until such a time as they could review these, uh, you know, the funds and what's going on. And there was a hearing on that on Tuesday, June 13th, and happy to talk more about that if that's of interest later on. But uh, basically, the SEC has filed a number of suits. And these are kind of, you know, not just serious for the companies involved, but kind of indicative of its broader position towards the U.S. crypto industry at this point in time. Yeah. And we've I think we've we've all kind of known that this is this has been coming. Right. The the suit against Coinbase has absolutely you know, it's been pretty well signaled that this was going to happen. I think we assumed that uh, something against Binance was coming. I don't think we knew it was 
coming, you know, in tandem with with Coinbase, kind of like this one two punch. Um, and it, it sounds like there's rumors of a DOJ criminal indictment coming against Binance as well, which obviously SEC is more of civil, uh, whereas the DOJ would be criminal. Department of Justice would be criminal. Uh, Lewis, maybe turning over to you, like, I mean, just how bad is this? Like how, <laughs> I mean, it looks pretty ugly. I, I mean, obviously the, the Coinbase one is just, you know, kind of unregistered securities. Um, you know, Binance is that plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, how, like, how, how much should we be like panicking right now as an industry? Like how, how bad is this situation? <laughs> yeah. Just to, yeah. Add, um, Go ahead. Is, just to add, um, what about the securities? I mean, how the U.S. is going to look at these ones as well? Um, what, what are the probabilities of, for example, the repo case uh, with all the human um, emails coming out? Um, what's your take on uh, both on the, uh, the, the exchanges and the, the securities as well? Yeah, well, I mean, those are all some... some... <laughs> Some, some some great points, and like with Nick, I think you're thinking, how do I kind of squeeze all this in? And uh, but at, at a high level, um, you know, the the core question um, is really the one you 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 put forward with all of this litigation, uh, holding aside the potential for criminal litigation, which 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 would be different, would turn on on other theories. The question really resolve, revolves around a very core point. What exactly are crypto assets in you know of themselves? What's their nature? What are we looking at? Because these are new sorts of things, and where do they kind of fit in the um, you know in the overall you know kind of scheme of regulation? And the SEC has not been this will I suppose shock nobody uh, in Brazil has not been as clear as uh, as could possibly be in terms of uh, telling people what they think crypto assets are. They've kind of had different positions at different times. But right now, um, they're pretty clear, whatever they said in the past, they're pretty clear that they think crypto assets are securities, just like shares of stock in Petrobras or, or anything like that. They're just the same thing. And so every person who deals with a crypto asset might as well be dealing with the security. The challenge, of course, as Nick was just laying out for companies like, like Binance and, and, and also Coinbase, is they haven't been treating uh, crypto assets as if they were securities um, at all. Uh, they've been treating them more or less as, as some other type of asset. You know, in the US, we have a separate category called commodities, but whatever they are, they're not regulated in the same way. And in the same way that you could deal in sort of posted stamps or collectible sneakers or video games, you know, without registering as a broker dealer or an exchange or anything else. That's how these companies uh, dealt with crypto assets. And now the SEC saying, well, you got it wrong there, folks. And they're, they're suing both of them. And I think uh, like, like Coinbase's contention has, or their contentions have been, have been twofold. They've really been saying, look, we've been trying to come in and register for years now, but you won't let us, or the, the process to register as, uh, register as a securities brokerage, essentially, uh, the process doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like there's some other companies that came in and have publicly, like Robinhood came up publicly, said that they tried to come in and register also, but they couldn't. And then Coinbase has also been saying uh, the, to the SEC, like, you guys literally let us go public uh, two years ago, um, and you didn't have any objection. You didn't raise any of this stuff back then. So why is this all of a sudden an issue now? Um, I, I guess maybe, you know, to anyone who wants to take that, like how valid is Coinbase's, uh, you know, kind of points of contention here? Let me, if Nick, if you want, I'll, I'll go first on that. You yeah, know, um, sure. So, so yeah, um, whether it's Coinbase or, or um, Binance or any of the other exchanges, I'll speak a little bit more generically. Um, you know, those are very, in my view, very, very fair concerns that those market participants are, are raising. I think there are, are good legal arguments for why these particular assets should not be characterized as securities, at least under the law as it stands today. As uh, I think, Nick, you know, we wrote a very lengthy article uh, going through this in, in, in great detail and explaining uh, that. And we've really never received any major uh, pushback. And it's interesting when you see the SEC talk about this, they don't really cite a lot of law. They talk about this thing you, I'm sure, here in Brazil have heard a lot about the Howey test. But, you know, it's very complex and, and not something we want to go into in great detail here. But um, I think they do have strong arguments. That being said, both 
you know, certainly Binance and Coinbase and any other um, marketplaces uh, that are named are going to have a lot of litigation on their hands. One of the concerns is, um, interestingly, um, Nick, as you know, one of the um, allegations in the complaint against Coinbase was that their non-custodial wallet product was also acting as a broker dealer. And this has important implications for any other non-custodial uh, wallet providers out there, because if, if you know, Coinbase wallet potentially was an unregistered broker dealer, then perhaps, you know, other very popular, I'll let you say the names, uh, you know, uh, non-custodial wallets could have issues as well. Yeah, I, I don't think there's, you know, too much I can add there. One thing I will say, um, you know, to Lewis's point about kind of just how we're classifying this. So yesterday, as I mentioned, there was a hearing in a D.C. district court on the SEC's motion to freeze all of Binance's U.S. assets. And one of the questions that the judge kept coming back to, this is uh, U.S. Judge Amy Berman Jackson, uh, was, you know, how does the SEC distinguish between a crypto asset and a crypto asset security? Uh, she asked this to the SEC attorneys. She asked the Binance attorney, uh, attorneys this. And didn't really get a clear answer. And, you know, she even commented near the end of the hearing, she had been asking what makes uh, or you know, what is a crypto asset if it's not security? And, uh, you know, quote, no one would answer her. So this is, you know, clearly a question that uh, I mean, I know the industry has been grappling with this in the U.S. for a number of years now, but it's now at the point where even the judges who are overseeing these cases are starting to try, you know, trying to figure out what exactly this is and, you uh, this might actually lead to, you know, some kind of judicial pronouncement on, you know, what kind of test we might be looking at or perhaps not. But it, it's a question that's now being grappled with at, you know, every level. I mean, just to add one quick thing to that, you know, just tie it into Brazil. I think as and when the U.S. does kind of come up with some really full theory, I think that will have a lot of influence on courts in Brazil and elsewhere. I know Brazil does have some version of this Howey test as part of your law. So, you know, if this is something, as Aaron, you were saying at the top, you know, really that that folks in Brazil should be paying attention to because it, it's going to have knock on effects, you know, globally in general and in Brazil in particular. Yeah, totally. This this week I had a meeting, um, a couple of meetings with traditional finance participants um, that are looking into Web3 uh, and, and secu sorry, tokens in general in crypto. And they were a bit afraid of um, all the SEC action that came, came to life in this last couple of weeks. But on the other hand, in the Brazilian market, there is uh, there is a framework coming out. Um, we had a decree coming out today, uh, appointing the Brazilian Central Bank as the uh, um, as the main regulator for the virtual asset service providers, and the CVM, which is the the Brazilian SEC, they will continue um, covering securities as they are in the traditional finance markets. So they are in this uh, uncertain moment where like, okay, the US has the, 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 the biggest liquidity in the world for commodities, securities and everything. So the kind of rule, the financial global system. And uh, meanwhile, locally, you have this structure coming out. Even for exchanges, Lewis, you were, you were just talking about um, the worry that the regulators have uh, when assets are mixed or how they are being used and so on. Um, 40 minutes ago since nick had um the timeline the time set where uh, when we were starting um 40 minutes ago we had a um, news coming out saying that the cvm is uh is going to request from exchanges to have a separation and the and the same licenses that the brazilian stock exchange has which that would what that means basically that instead of um, an exchange um having the trading book uh doing the settlement and clearing um they will need to do that separately so that also means custody as well of course so uh, uh, brazil is looking at this at this um at, at this problem let's say um separating assets as like okay this is just traditional finance like uh, with a new envelope but the system on how everything is working, like the processes and the, the institutions that are participating in that market, 
are going to be um, is what they're looking at actually to regulate. So for tokens, it's just like, okay, you have these types of tokens. I think it's a, a circular number 40 that they issued saying, t talking about that. So um, on, on that point, like, what do you guys think are the main challenges for the US to, to try and come with a, a more proactive approach to, to this market and try and see it as the opportunity it is? I mean, I think that is a kind of a complex question because, you know, right now there's a number of different possible pathways that the U.S. could create some kind of, you know, more, uh, you know, de definitive framework for crypto asset issuers and trading platforms. That could be Congress, but so far Congress has, uh, it's held a number of hearings. We've seen a number of pieces of legislation introduced, but there doesn't seem to be much appetite to actually passing these bills and signing them into law at at least at you know this point right now in the middle of 2023 the regulators could try and uh, come up with some kind of more definitive framework but you know the the major federal regulators that we're looking at in the US there's the SEC which we've talked about its chair Gary Gensler has said he does not believe at this time that there is a need for more you know clear uh, guidance um, they have uh, engaged in some kinds of rulemaking and the industry has responded to those pieces of you know proposed regulation but it's not really, I think, as far as the industry, they don't go as far as the industry hopes it might. There's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is the other major federal regulator for commodities, as Lewis mentioned. But the CFTC is kind of hamstrung in a sense that it is able to regulate commodities, but it doesn't have spot market authority over a lot of uh, things, including at this point, digital assets. And it would really need Congress to sign off on granting it that authority. And again, it, it doesn't, at least to me, appear as if Congress is in any rush to do that. Um, there's a couple other, you know, possible pathways. They're much less likely to happen and really not, I think, worth delving into at this point. But um, yeah, there's just a number of, I don't want to call them roadblocks. It's not that there's anything actively blocking these things. It's just that there are other issues that are deemed more important or the crypto questions are not urgent enough to warrant action in the views of, you know, the people who might be able to move some kind of, you know, guidance or regulation or legislation. So turning back here. to turning back to these lawsuits really quick, uh, in particular against both the exchanges as well as the tokens that have been named in these lawsuits, right? This is kind of a, uh, you know, the SEC instead of instead of filing charges against these actual projects is is or bringing 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 a lawsuit against these particular projects, they are instead just naming them in the lawsuits against Coinbase and Binance. So there's kind of like two fronts in the battle here. I mean, on one hand, it's kind of savvy of them to just go after the exchange and list like 15 tokens as like oh we consider these to be securities, and all we have to do is just prove that one of these is actually security, and then bam, you're guilty of operating unlicensed. Uh, you know, was it like an unregistered crypto exchange, bro, or whatever <laughs> from the that, that quote for that Binance uh, compliance officer guy uh, that the SEC was tweeting out? Um, so, it, I mean, it is from their, I mean, to give, I guess, to give them credit, like it's a pretty savvy tactic, I guess, to try to, you know, just wipe out as much of the market as possible in one mo or, one or two uh, swings, essentially. Um, but as the litigation moves ahead here, uh, maybe talk a bit about, maybe Lewis will turn to you here. Uh, what are the kind of the next steps in this litigation? I mean, obviously this stuff is going to take probably years. I mean, you see like Binance is lawyering up like crazy right now. Uh, Coinbase has obviously done the same. Uh, this stuff is going to take a long time to play out. But like, um, you know, what are the kind of the next steps here? And then what type of, of, of precedent do you maybe see coming out of this eventually that might actually give us some clarity uh, as far as tokens uh, or as far as just like how, how these exchanges are supposed to be operating in the U.S.? Yeah. So, I mean, you're certainly right, um, Aaron, that, that, you know, the court process quite likely could, could drag on for years. We've seen the SEC's claim against Ripple Labs. Uh, now, I think we're at the two and a half year mark, something like that. Right, um, Nick? I think, I think we are expecting something to come from the trial judge before the end of the summer. Uh, but yeah, who knows? An important thing to bear in mind, though, is the SEC's case against Ripple Lab differs dramatically from their case against the two marketplaces. In the case of um, Ripple Labs, what the SEC has asserted is that Ripple Labs raised money 
through selling something and the purchasers of that something were expecting you know to make profit and not through their own effort they weren't consuming it they were going to use it they were going to use the the token to you know do money transfers they were like wow this is going to be great can't wait for you know number to go up and um that's the picture you know issue at least i won't say definition uh with with deference but the picture issue of what the Howey test is about, what the idea of an investment contract is, I'm going to you, I'm saying, hey, I've got a great idea. If you buy some of what I have, it's going to be more valuable later. Give me the money. I'll pool that with those of other folks, do something, and you know, you'll make some money and I'll make some money. What's not to like? That is the quintessential investment contract. And that's what the FEC's case is about with Ripple Labs, that's a much more straightforward case. It doesn't matter in the case of Ripple Labs whether the court finds that the XRP token is or is not a security. Frankly, it's irrelevant. It just has nothing to do with things. In all the many Howey cases that preceded it, the thing that was sold, and there's all kinds of different kind of interesting little stories of cases, people pitching ideas, you know, buy some whiskey from me, I'll age it and it'll go up. Buy some chinchillas or, you know, you know, things, I'll, I'll skin them and, you know, sell the, sell the pelts, you know. There's stuff with posted stamps. There's all kinds of things, right? None of those are securities, right? That's the thing. Now the SEC is saying that somehow in ways they haven't explained, in their mind, this thing, and remember, all a digital asset is, is a number, right? It's the ability to, you have a private key to a public address that allows you to give an instruction to a network of computers. It doesn't create rights. It doesn't even create a relationship with any other entity. I think one of the things we always push back on is when people talk about a crypto asset issuer. Issuer suggests that there's some relationship between two people. I issued it, now you have it. But crypto assets are just sold. You, you know, they, so so they don't have this this same dynamic, and the SEC hasn't really grappled with that. So the the XRP case is is kind of different with with Binance and with Coinbase. The SEC is going to ask, have to establish. But Aaron, just to wrap up and just address your last point, the catch is yes, all they have to do is show one crypto asset on one of those exchanges as a security. But that the question then becomes, what's the remedy? What do you do about that? Because the exchange, oh, thank you, I'll delist it. We're done now, right? We're done here. So so the SEC has this challenge, which is it's not just that there's one, because that's easy to address. It's somehow that they're almost all securities. But then how do you do that? It's a real interesting challenge. Yeah, and I think the... Um, the, the, the I mean, move, moving ahead over, moving over to the Binance side, I think, because I feel like... I mean, I feel like this is my opinion. I feel like it's been supported by other sort of commentators I've listened to over the last couple of days on this, but it seems like the SEC or the, the Coinbase case is a bit, it's like, it's a bit straightforward in the sense of like, is it just an unregistered securities exchange or is it, is it not? Or, and, and to your point, like, you know, how are they going to you know remedy that if some of these tokens are found to be securities in the court of law? But I think that the Binance case is where things get a lot murkier. And I think it's a bit more concerning because, um, I mean, a like Binance is basically, in my opinion, Binance is like too big to fail. Like, if Binance like goes under for some reason, like, like that's like, what do you even have left in this industry, <laughs> right? Uh, like, what you know? I mean, I wish it wasn't that way, but it's kind of kind of the reality, right? Um, so, I guess a couple of questions, and and um, you know, I feel I guess Nick or Lewis, whoever wants to jump in here. I mean, what becomes of Binance US? Uh, it appears that Binance US is basically just set up to be like the punching bag. Right, that you know, <laughs> that would just bear the brunt of all the the lawsuits that would inevitably come, um, and it, and that you know, in hindsight, it may it's it's kind of painfully obvious why like people like Catherine Coley and Brian Brooks were just like hightailed it out of there, you know, after they were brought in. Um, so what happens to Binance US? And I mean, I guess does that even matter in any in it? But I think that you know, Binance Global, Binance Worldwide is probably the the what we have to be more concerned about. Um, and, you know, does CZ end up becoming, does CZ and Binance end up becoming, you know, the next uh, BitMEX and Arthur Hayes here, um, you know, especially with, with potential DOJ uh, criminal, uh, you know, charges coming that, that have been rumored on Twitter, at least. I have I've no inside knowledge of any of that, but I've just seen people talking about it on Twitter. Um, but, I mean, Nick, do you want to take a stab at that and then pass over to Lewis? Sure. Um, on the DOJ front, 
as you mentioned, there have been rumors and reports of a potential DOJ action against Binance for years. Um, at this stage uh, in time, I don't think we know enough to say for sure if it's going to happen, whether or not the DOJ and Binance will find a settlement agreement that they can, you know, go work toward, uh, or if it's going to be a kind of, you know, there will be an indictment and the DOJ will want to arrest CZ and other Binance executives. Like, we just don't know at this point in time, you know, for sure what that's going to look like. What we do know is that Binance, which, by the way, uh, I'm not sure if we you know, we haven't touched on this yet, and your audience may not be aware, but the CFTC actually sued Binance a couple months ago as well on a number of not even similar charges on a number of charges uh, against Binance and CZ, and so Binance is actually facing a couple different fronts right now, um, with the potential to at some point be facing you know charges uh, against three major federal regulators. Uh, for now, it's the two. Uh, and the charges are pretty severe. I don't know if Binance is itself at risk right now based on the CFTC and SEC charges. If they can, you know, disconnect from the U.S., they're probably fine, right? The U.S. regulators uh, have a limited jurisdiction and it ends where uh, there's no more U.S. customers or servers or whatever. If the U.S. jurisdiction continues, then sure, maybe there's a bit more danger, but Right now, the real danger seems to be the Binance US, which is the you know US affiliate. The SEC did allege that Binance US's parent company's parent company is majority owned by CZ, uh, so like eighty plus percent, and the remainder goes to you know a couple other investors. So uh, there's some risk there. But if Binance US, which at this point has about two point two billion in assets according to the SEC, uh, if that's shut down, then Binance itself. I think is kind of, you know, fairly well isolated, at least in terms of if they've been actually able to cut off the U.S. customers, which, again, the SEC has alleged that that's not the case, but you, we haven't gotten that far into litigation yet to see, you know, what evidence they'll be able to provide on that. Um, I'll let loose, uh, you know, if you have any other thoughts on that. But, yeah, from where I'm sitting... Nick, I think it's a great summary, um, uh, and and I think you make a, a fantastic point that um, one of the things the U.S. is unfortunately famous for is sort of a, a general disregard for the rest of the world, and sort of sort of everything kind of revolves around the U.S. But as you rightly point out, you know uh, whether it's Binance or other uh, you know crypto marketplaces, they are operating in other jurisdictions. I think. The issue here really goes to a, a core concern is, is, is what regulators are seeking to do is provide genuine protection to investors or just stop crypto. And sometimes you, you scratch your head and wonder what the agenda is. You know, clearly based on some of the allegations, some of these marketplaces could probably do a better job. And we see in Europe with Mika, with other frameworks, you know, I think each jurisdiction should put in place the appropriate regulatory guardrails to protect their citizens in the way that their legislatures, you know, feel makes sense. We saw, for example, with FTX, Japan came out very well, and they had a very rigorous uh, program. And my understanding is broadly that Japanese investors came out more or less whole. So I think each jurisdiction needs to balance these concerns and have respect for other jurisdictions distinct, to, you know, decisions around that. And so to your point, Nick, I think I'd like to see the U.S. situation addressed and then people operating in other jurisdictions need to comply with the laws of those jurisdictions and the regulators in those jurisdictions should address, you know, failings in that regard. You know, the U.S. is not the cop of the world and the U.S. is not here to make decisions about whether people in Brazil people in Europe, people in Asia should or should not be dealing with and using crypto assets. That's not really our bound. So I think we should take care of the investors that are based here in the U.S. And that's absolutely the regulator's job and they should do that. But we should also recognize that those markets and products and services that are not in the U.S. are the primary concern of other parties. And to and your point there, um, you know, one of the CFTC's talking points since the FTX collapse has been that um, Ledger X, which is a actually a long running crypto derivatives platform in the U.S., which was then briefly acquired by FTX, uh, didn't have any major losses. And the CFTC pointed that out as a you know argument for why it should be granted spot market authority because, in you know the CFTC's words, they already have a lot of those protections that you know, for example, 
Japan has uh, that prevented those kinds of losses. So it is something that has been discussed and is continuing to be discussed, uh, at least at some levels in the U.S. I'd like to switch gears quickly. I, I want to come back to the, the kind of the topic of, of just, you know, kind of processing this from a global perspective and what does this kind of mean for other markets um, and, and particularly Brazil. And um, I know Antonio will have some thoughts on that as well. But before we dive into that, I wanted to, to just add, talk a bit about uh, these Bill Hinman emails, right? And this is a very sort of, you know, it's like it's like the Hillary Clinton emails from 2016. It's like this, like you know, this weird, like it's like there's going to be something good in those emails. I know, like crypto people have been like, you know, ever since 2018 when this speech came out, it's been, uh, you know, it's a subject of fascination. Uh, but Nick, do you want to just give us kind of a quick overview of like what is like this whole Hinman situation and? I guess from my view, it looked it kind of looks like this whole email, like the emails being disclosed, which looks like a complete kind of dumpster fire for the SEC that they have to deal with now. But uh, or it doesn't make them look very flattering, I guess, to put it to put it kindly. Um, but Nick, do you want to kind of give us an overview? And then Lewis would love your your kind of two cents on this whole situation as well. Sure. So as you mentioned, in June 2018, uh, at the time, director of corporation finance, which is a division within the SEC, William Hinman, gave a speech saying that in his view, Ether, while it might have looked like a security when it was uh, ICO'd back in whenever it launched, I think 2016, at that time in 2018, in his view, it did not look like a security anymore. Um, basically kind of giving rise to this idea that even if a crypto asset is a security when it's launched, if it becomes you know quote uh, sufficiently decentralized, it could one day no longer be a security. And that was, uh, you know, a kind of a landmark moment, I think, in the crypto industry. A lot of people, a lot of companies pointed to that and said, hey, OK, so, you know, sure, maybe if we have a, uh, you know, a bit of time to decentralize ourselves, we'll be able to be, you know, a not a security at some future date, even if we're launching in a way that kind of looks like a security. So uh, this speech was, as far as I can tell, like never really referenced again at any level within the SEC, I think. Former SEC Chair Jay Clayton might have pointed to it once um, in saying that he agreed with Inman, uh, sort of, and not even in a direct way, but largely the SEC kind of ignored it. Um, fast forward to you know the end of 2020 when the SEC sued Ripple. Across the discovery process over the next year and a half, one of the things Ripple really asked for was you know were the emails surrounding the development of that speech. Um, basically, you know, what were the internal deliberations like and how did that speech come to be? That was finally a judge ruled on that. Um, I think it was actually in January 2022. So a full 18 months ago, a judge ruled that those emails had to be released. Uh, Ripple received them. And uh, yesterday they published those emails and they did show provided honestly a really fascinating look at the internal process. There were a number of SEC officials who were involved in not crafting the speech per se, but in providing feedback in discussing the merits or the points of the speech. You had, uh, you know, officials from the SEC division of trading and markets, investment management, uh, some of the enforcement uh, division officials were involved in the emails, the office of general counsel at the SEC. So a large swath of the SEC's uh, directors and officials were involved in providing feedback on the speech. And a lot of that feedback kind of boiled down to uh, individuals saying, you know, we're not sure you're making this point as clearly as you can. We're not 100% sure that, you know, these arguments that you're making are fully grounded in the law. And at this point, I haven't had a time to do a really, you know, strong like side by side comparison of the different drafts of the speech. It is worth noting that the earliest version of the speech didn't mention ether. Uh, later versions did. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a dumpster fire for the SEC. It, I think it shows that there was a lot of deliberation around it and, uh, you know, a lot of confusion afterward as to whether or not the speech held any kind of real force. Um, I know Ripple's now saying that, you know. The speech shows that there was confusion and that the, you know, its publication and that Hinman's, you know, giving that speech really just made things a little bit, you know, weirder for everyone. Um, but it does show that there was, uh, you know, a lot of input on the speech that kind of indicated that maybe it wasn't going to be the kind of precedent that people in 2018 thought it would be. Yeah. And, and Lewis, I'd like your thoughts on this too, but, but I think I just want to emphasize that, I mean, ever since that speech came out is, has been kind of regarded by the industry in a lot of ways as, as kind of gospel, if you will, for like, Oh, this is, if, if we're just sufficiently decentralized, uh, then, you know, we yeah. don't have to worry about this stuff anymore, basically. That, and, was, that was a whole thing. People spent time on yeah. that. And 
money and yeah. resources. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it was, you know, good for people like Lewis with, you know, a couple clients coming to you asking how they can become sufficiently decentralized. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but I think, and then, you know, the, the reaction from some folks in the industry and Ripple has just been like, look, like these guys, uh, like they're just creating, like they're just creating more confusion. And then they're going out and suing people uh, for not following, you know, for not following the laws when they're like, you're not following regulations when internally they're like d- deliberately putting out confusing messaging, making it hard for people to know what they're actually supposed to be doing. And then you sue them for not following those rules. Uh, but Lewis would love your take on these. Um, you know, just, I guess from whatever angle you want to take it. Yeah, sure. You know, Aaron and, and um, you know, I, I agree with almost everything um, Nick said at one point of clarification, which is very technical, but it is important. And just anybody go back and look at the speech at no point in the speech does Bill Hinman say Ether is a security or Ether is not a security? In fact, he uses this very complicated sort of way of expressing it that Ether may be sold in a transaction that is not a securities transaction. And this is really important because he did understand that the issue is not the token is just a number. And in fact, at one point in the speech, Nick, you probably recall, he talks about a glass of whiskey and it's just, you know, it's enjoyable to drink, but right. It, it's what he talks about is whether the transaction is one that should be regulated as a securities transaction. And that is a really important legal distinction. So just just other than that, I agree with everything you said. In particular, just on the on the point that I don't think it's that much of a dumpster fire. I'd go more in the nothing burger uh, department. I mean, you know, for I'm sure, um, you know, Aaron and Antonio, a lot of your listeners are devs and they work in dev shops. And just like working in dev shop, you got a lot of different people, with different skill sets, all working together in some sort of whiteboard, you know, notion environment we're all collaborating and somebody said i don't know about that ux thing and what about this ah, it's a terrible idea it looks terrible blue make it blue you know um that's basically what was going on inside the sec they were trying they were discussing and different people have different perspectives that's normal and so i don't think there's anything particularly smoking gun ish i mean it would have been nice i think the the fundamental issue is that the one nick you ended on which is they did take a position. I think the uh, video clip, which I'd forgotten about, about the chair at the time, Jay Clayton, he's very explicit. He says, this is our view. If you want to know about crypto assets, go look at Bill Hemmings' speech. So I think, you know, for a time, it appeared that that was the position of the SEC, that this idea of sufficient decentralization, they have backed away from that now. And I think you're absolutely right. It's like people relied on that and they did build processes for whatever it's worth and we wrote this long article which maybe you'll be kind enough to post in the in the show chat or something put a link to it um i just think that's wrong as a matter of law it it, whether a network is decentralized or not decentralized is irrelevant to whether an asset is or is not a security these are two Mm. different things an asset is or is not a security if it creates a legal relationship between two or more people. So a share of stock, indebtedness. I challenge anyone to find me something that's otherwise a security that doesn't create a legal relationship. You know, one good example is if you have, whether it's equity, debt, or anything else, if the person who issued it, right, disappears, goes away, goes bankrupt, there is no more security. But of course, with crypto assets, we have these sort of odd situations of whoever was the company that initially promoted it, they are gone now, and the asset still seems to be kicking around, and people like it for whatever sometimes meme reasons, right? Because they're because they're not securities, right? They 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 are these just assets that were created. They're weird assets, and they deserve to be regulated, but they're not securities. So I think, unfortunately, although well intended, the speech really set people down this sort of incorrect path because you can never know first and foremost, whether a network is sufficiently decentralized, because nobody quite knows what it means. Vitalik's tried his best. He has, you know, trouble explaining it. But even if you thought or understood it, if you were sufficiently decentralized at one point, what's to say in another point, you re-centralize. And we've seen that. We've seen this unfortunate incident with Arbitrum recently, right? Where like, oh, shoot, I forgot to put some ether in the machine and and, and the whole network stopped, right? It's, that's not very decentralized. Um, so, um, you know, it seems crazy when you think about it to say the status of an asset held by somebody unrelated to the network is going to change based on whether somebody puts some ethers in the mach- in, in the meter or not, or all the myriad other you know things that go on. So I think we need to reset 
and think about it and, you know, kind of start up again. And there are a couple of bills and maybe I know, Aaron, we're going to have to be wrapping up and Antonio, but maybe, um, you know, Nick, you want to talk about the House bill a little bit or something. I think that would be kind of an interesting way to kind of bring some of your listeners around to where we are at this very moment. Yeah, maybe maybe we can do once you have to hop here at the top of the hour. Maybe maybe Nick, if you can stay on a couple extra minutes and just and give maybe an yeah. overview like the McHenry bill and the uh, the fire Gary Gensler bill, uh, <laughs> which sure. probably isn't going to go anywhere, but you know, <laughs> creates good opt. You know, it's a creates you know gets people on Twitter excited, I suppose. Um, so maybe um, for for the last kind of ten minutes that we have, Lewis here, let's let's kind of turn the conversation to um, kind of this question of offshoring, right? Of of you know. The, the industry is, you know, uh, in in the U.S. is is rife with talking points now about, oh, you know, your Gary Gensler is killing American innovation and killing American jobs, and he's driving all those people off seas. And you know, people have been saying this for years, um, but I think I, I think now there's maybe a bit more compelling argument that this is actually happening. We just saw like A16Z open up a UK office. Um, obviously, Coinbase and Gemini have kind of set up their own operations offshore. Coinbase just launched in Brazil fairly recently. Um, um, but like Lewis, from your vantage point, I guess, to what extent do you see this like crypto offshoring phenomenon actually happening? Uh, and Nick would like to get your take on that as well, but let's start with Lewis. And, um, and in general, I mean, I guess if for, for folks in the outside, you know, elsewhere in the world who are observing this and trying to figure out, okay, like, is there an opportunity here that I can capitalize on? Um, you know, like what, what maybe would you tell them or what, what kind of advice might you give them or? Or, 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 you know, how can you help them kind of like, kind of, you know, cut through some of the hype perhaps, or some of the, some of the rhetoric? Totally. Um, it's a great question, Aaron. And, and, and as an active pr practitioner in the space in the U.S., we absolutely see many of our clients, you know, saying, you know, maybe I just shouldn't be here anymore. And it's a terrible shame. These are some of our brightest you know, minds both in computer science and economics and all these different fields, they're very creative and they're basically feel like they're being told you're not wanted here. Are there bad actors in crypto? Well, of course there are. There are tons of bad actors. There's no shortage of bad actors. But that doesn't mean you need to, as the saying goes, chase the baby out with the bathwater. Um, uh, another expression I like to use, Aaron, is when you open the door, you know, a lot of flies can come in, you know, so we've opened things up with crypto. And yes, there's bad things, but there's so many talented people and they are leaving the United States. They're forming companies, not just, you know, offshore sort of island type jurisdictions, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, but they're moving to Europe, they're moving to Portugal, they're moving to Brazil in some cases. Um, I know one uh, great guy moved to Brazil. Um, and, um, you know, so, um, we really are risking just sending a strong message to really good faith, bright, capable people. You're not wanted here. And it's going to, you know, it's going to take its toll. And I think people are going to be slow uh, kind of come back. I'm curious, Nick, you talk as a reporter um, to a lot of different folks. Are you picking up some of that as well? So I mostly talk to companies at this point rather than developers and while I've heard a lot about companies saying that they're expanding or expanding and then saying they're going to be offshoring as part of that, a lot of the bigger companies, at least, they seem to be kind of using this, you know, we're going to offshore rhetoric. But what they really mean is they're setting up an additional office, but they don't plan to leave the U.S. And I think that's kind of causing, honestly, a little bit of confusion now because, you know, Coinbase, I think, just as an example of a company that uh, recently announced, um, you know, new offices and but it's been expanding for a while. Uh, it has offices and headquarters in multiple different countries. Um, A16Z, another good example. They set up a UK office, but I don't think that means the same thing as you know leaving the US. And I'm sure you know. I think I've I've heard more from you know kind of the small developers, the individuals, the startups, you know, the not multi billion dollar companies that are kind of more inclined to do so. But at least as far as I can tell the bigger companies, the ones that have been kind of, you know, making a, the most noise publicly about this aren't really doing it, at least at this time. Got it. Got yeah, it. I think, I think it's, it's a little bit of a, like an up and coming trend, but, but it's definitely great yeah. to get your perspective, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the smaller companies also probably just easier for, you know, startups and developers and the smaller companies to be able to make that kind of shift. Uh, you know, they don't have huge deep roots or large existing customer bases. Um, the bigger companies, they're, 
even if they wanted to, they'd have to extricate themselves from the U.S. And as we've seen with Binance and Binance U.S., that's not like uh, that's not an easy or quick thing to happen. Yeah, um, but even even though yeah. some of them are taking some risks, right? Like Coinbase going on with their Coin, Coinbase Global, Gemini trying the same. Um, I think there is a. I, I do believe that the technology and the brains are not escaping the U.S. yet. Uh, but the the U.S. is losing an opportunity to be ahead of this because, as I said before, it's basically the financial global system. So it does scare a lot of people off. And so, well, what we see is this, um, let's say, the U.S. becomes more a financial market or a financial participant. I mean, as in being very active in VCs, uh, equity investments abroad rather than building that inside. So, uh, well, this is what I'm seeing here in Brazil. I'm seeing that there is interest to build some of these uh, offshoring. And so it is, uh, do you guys see this? Um, I don't know, Aaron, uh, if you had any other question, but and you just mentioned this, Lewis. Um, what are you guys seeing as being the trends for the regulator, regulatory bodies uh, around the world? And um, how does impact bring uh, brain and intellectual uh, knowledge from this uh, from the U.S. and some other countries? And maybe maybe if I can piggyback on that really quick too. Um, my my last question for for Lewis was just going to be like, what advice would you give perhaps you know regulators here in Brazil who are like we've like they've just just this morning they, there was a decree issued that will kick off kind of the formal regulatory process. There's been enabling legislation passed. Now there's now it's kind of the, you know, the, the meat and potatoes part of just actually putting together the rules. And, you know, as somebody who's been in this industry for a long time, obviously talked to a lot of regulators in the U.S. and elsewhere, um, you know, maybe what kind of advice might you have for, for, for these folks? Uh, absolutely. I, th I think the number one thing, and, and also, I I Antonio, into your question of trends, you know, I see two trends. And the one that I would recommend to folks here in Brazil, um, you know, especially, you know, regulators or, or policymakers is one trend is we see just basically trying to stamp out crypto, just trying to scare people away. Nothing about it works. You know, we recently we saw the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, saying we have plenty of fiat currency works great. Why do we need cryptocurrencies? You know, right. So, you know, I mean, you'd want to cry kind of right. So so you've got one trend is just how do we make this as difficult? as possible and maybe just get people to just stop if, if we can. I, I think I would rather say if, if, a, if a jurisdiction, whether it's China, as we saw, you know, chooses to say, we think crypto is such an inherently bad idea, we're going to go through the rule of law, invoke, you know, our legislator, whatever our process is, and say, it's illegal. I'm sorry, there's things that are illegal. There are drugs that are illegal. There are acts that are illegal. Fair enough. Like you go through that process, you want to make this illegal, you do. But if it's not, and that's the other trend, right? And this is where Brazil can come in. If it's not going to be illegal, then the priority is consumer protection, user protection. How do we set up a framework to succeed? Not sort of, you know, and, and, and you know, how do we set up a framework to stop people of doing something that is legal, right? Again, if it's going to be illegal, fine. But if it's not illegal, let's protect people. And Brazil, I think, has an opportunity to, to, to work with its framework and show users of crypto assets how they can engage, learn, and be protected and not be subject to things like, you know, FTX and, and other failures, Celsius. We've had a whole, you know, a list of failures, Voyager, et cetera. And so I, I think that the trend is think about what went wrong. For example, we talked, I think, at the top about custody a bit and, and things like that. And think about how can we implement systems like in Japan that have actually you know, stood uh, the test of time and worked out very well. I was just talking to somebody who was uh, working on a Japanese project. He said, people are very optimistic in Japan. Like nothing went wrong. There's a lot of cool things. Let's go do it. So we want to protect uh, people and not you know just do it so anyway those are my thoughts um uh, it's a pleasure obrigado thank you for having me on um and i look forward to uh perhaps next time and maybe even seeing you um in brazil sometime so i'll, I'll leave the studio and thank you all for joining okay awesome bye -bye. thanks so much for your time lewis bye 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 so um so nick since we, we have you for a couple more minutes here uh maybe we can kind of dive into a bit more of uh kind of what's been happening on the legislative front in the us we we had this um, the McHenry bill that was i think that was 
released or it was introduced into to the U.S. Congress on the Friday before all the lawsuits happened. So it, it, it seems like, uh, you know, Gensler and his team sort of worked through the weekend to be able to get these lawsuits out in response to the <laughs> this legislation being introduced. But uh, maybe talk a bit about what this legislation is exactly and what it's I mean, it's, it's it seems pretty, you know, this is probably the most robust you know, favorable legislation for the industry that's been sort of introduced to date. So we'd love to get your thoughts on, uh, on just, uh, you know, what's significant about this. Yeah, really quickly, if I could, just before getting into that, sure. uh, the only thing I think I'd add on to what Lewis was saying just now is, you know, he was discussing kind of the regulatory, uh, possible regulatory approaches. Um, one thing I'd also just like to point out that, you know, a lot of, I think, what we're seeing from regulators over the last, you know, year or so is a response in part to the explosions of the last year. You know, it's not just FTX and Celsius. We've seen right. crypto companies literally in, you know, I think four or five different jurisdictions that we know of, you know, filed for bankruptcy or, uh, you know, announced that they're, you know, losing their customers' money. Uh, we had this, you know, Wall Street Journal report just this week saying that something like half of North Korea's entire nuclear missile program was funded by stolen crypto. Uh, crypto analytics firm elliptic reported this week that you know there's like a hundred million dollar hack of you know atomic wallet and that was all north korea using its funds you know going through its laundered or laundering the funds through sanctioned uh platforms so you, and so, you still get people that say crypto has no use case right right exactly yeah, look but, at this, but i think <laughs> right yeah no but like my point is like, like know, look at north, north korea crypto, man right? yeah yeah like that is that should be a huge red flag like I think there's some extent to which the crypto industry as an industry needs to kind of acknowledge that, you know, hey, there are some kind of, you know, there are some pretty big issues here. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, totally. is there a way to kind of tamp down on that? Um, as far as the legislation goes, so we, it's, we've actually seen a number of bills introduced recently. The market structure bill that you're referring to from Congressman Patrick McHenry, who right now is the chair of the House Financial Services Committee, was actually developed jointly with congressman glenn thompson who is the chair of the house agriculture committee um and this is important because the way the u.s uh kind of regulatory system is set up in the house the financial services committee oversees the sec which is one of the major regulators we've been talking about you know for this entire episode but the cftc is actually overseen by the agriculture committees in both the house and the senate and it's because originally the cftc was in charge of agriculture products uh, derivatives products um, you know, wheat futures, things like that, later oil and other commodities. So any legislation to have, you know, a snowflake's chance of going through the process and becoming law has to have sign off uh, and support from both of these committees. And so the market structure bill is significant because it is something jointly developed by both these committees. And, you know, it kind of creates these new provisions for the SEC and the CFTC to explain, OK, you know, here's how. Uh, regulators might take a look at these things. Here's how they might enforce actions or how they might not be able to enforce certain you know actions. Um, I honestly haven't had a chance to go in depth on the legislation yet. Um, so I'm just going to give you the broad strokes. It, this is also you know, one of the many bills that have been introduced. The other major bill that we've been seeing more discussion on is on stablecoin legislation in particular. And that one is still, I think, strictly in the House Financial Services Committee, but it is also more of a negotiation between Republicans and Democrats. So the two major parties are both, at this point, looking and talking about this bill. Um, can, can we pause on that for just yeah. a second? So, uh, I mean, I'm just just think I, I was just thinking back to that uh, that Forbes the cover of Forbes with Jeremy Allaire on the the cover that came out last week that e edition of Forbes, and it's like it was a picture of Jeremy Allaire from Circle, and it says like, "Please regulate me." And then, uh, then they misspelled stable coin, like in the, in the, in the time. it was, it was a bizarre, it was a very bizarre, like magazine cover, but, but, um, but obviously like yeah, circle, yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, the point, the point being is that, uh, like the stable coin community, I guess, if you want to call it, that has been kind of crying out, like, you know, like, look, like we need some kind of like, just do something right. Uh, to, to sort of make this more legitimate, uh, if you don't make us more legitimate then uh you know people are just going to go use tether and uh you've i mean i don't have any particular grief with tether but like but look but but you can see even in the volumes like tether volumes have 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 gone up significantly the last few months whereas usdc has gone down um 
so the the arguments for people like circle seem do seem to be uh holding water in that that case um but like what is like the contention in like, stable coin legislation seems like probably like the, the easiest like kind of thing to like the least controversial thing potentially to to try to pass or you know create some legislation around or or, or pass this legislation but what what do you see as the um kind of the points of contention here uh that are are, are maybe blocking this from from moving there's actually honestly there's so many to be honest like i think you're right you know on the face of it it's something that both democrats and republicans in the house and the senate and congress uh sorry and the you know presidential administration all agree there should be some kind of legislation on this the problem kind of the problems rather arise when you start looking at how this actually works in practice so first you have to define a stable coin you know are you trying to make uh something that is a broad definition and a crypto asset that has a value pegged to the value of something else, like for example, the U.S. dollar. Uh, do you include reserve-backed stablecoins only, or do you look at algorithmic stablecoins and other types of stablecoins? Do you look at what kind of assets they're backed by? So, is it just strictly U.S. dollars in a bank account? Is it treasuries? Is it you know gold? Is it whatever? So that's one level of the kind of issues that you're looking at. The next level comes in when you're talking about licensing stablecoin issuers. Do they get licensed as you know non-bank financial institutions? Do they have to be trust companies? Do they have to work with trust companies? Uh, what kind of legislation do you have to create to define that part? Um, do they need FDIC insurance if they're you know these non-bank financial institutions that are also not trust companies? Um, should it be overseen by the state level, at the federal level? So who are the regulators that have to be involved? Do they have to come up with guidance for these issuers or would the legislation itself be sufficient for that? So there's a number of issues that have to be worked out. Um, I think a lot of the contentions kind of come into, you know, really these finer details, uh, checking whether or not the Federal Reserve has, you know, ultimate oversight authority, whether or not state regulators have that, who, what, what types of entities. It's, it's a lot of its details, but they're important details and um, you know, for what it's worth, we are seeing progress on this, right? We know last year, uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who at the time was the chair of the committee and is now the ranking member, meaning she's the senior most Democrat, and Congressman McHenry, who is the senior most Republican, uh, you know, they've been working on this for well over a year now. And uh, we're seeing multiple draft bills introduced, and we're seeing compromise bills introduced, and, uh, you know, the lawmakers are talking about this. So we are seeing progress, um, which is, you know, from my perspective of someone who's been covering Yeah, so, yeah, I've been covering this for a while, and we are seeing progress. Um, you know, just from where we were even a year ago, the fact that we now have multiple iterative drafts and, you know, drafts from both the House, or sorry, both Republicans and Democrats, and we're seeing statements from these lawmakers overseeing this saying, okay, here's how we're looking at this, and here are the most important things that we're looking at, or, you know, here's where we disagree. That is progress. So, this actually might well be the you know first bill we'd see get passed at least by the House. Uh, we haven't seen any uh, you know similar versions on the Senate side yet, so um, TBD on what happens on the Senate. But it, there is progress happening on this. And then um, I guess Antonio, if you have any other questions, feel free. But I, I guess I had one one other question I wanted to ask you about uh, like Ryan Selkis, who's the 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 CEO of Masari. Uh, he's, he's kind of come out with this grand plan of, of raising a hundred million dollars for a kind of a political action, uh, effort that will basically, basically kind of like Washington DC trench warfare, you know, kind of going on the offensive really in DC, uh, with, with, you know, advancing narratives and also kind of punishing people electorally who are, uh, whether they be, you know, elected representatives or they'd be unelected bureaucrats kind of punishing these people who, you know, don't kind of fall in line with what we want them to be doing. Um, and, you know, and, and I mean, in, in my view, I look at this, I'm like, this is probably a good thing. Uh, Cause I feel like our, our industry has kind of played defense in Washington for a very long time. And I think we're seeing some of the, uh, the effects of that now uh, you can only play defense for so long before, you know, your enemy just kind of breaks you and destroys you. Um, and um, anyway, but I would just kind of like your thoughts on on uh, this this campaign that that Selkis is launching to really go on the offensive. And um, I mean, word on the street is that he has a 
like a 220 page uh, like document of opposition research on Gary Gensler. Uh, <laughs> So it'll be interesting to see what comes out on that. But I have no idea if that's true or not. But like I just heard that from somebody. But um uh but anyway, would like your thoughts on kind of like you know, kind of making yeah. crypto almost like an electoral like election issue and really trying to instead of trying to win by just saying, Hey, look at us, we're doing so many nice things, but it's really more of like trying to play like a political battle here. I think the biggest question right now that I have is is crypto or will crypto be an election issue? in november 2020 what year are we in 2024 um yeah i think ryan's built some really cool stuff and i'm looking forward to seeing what he actually you know does with this campaign i know he's just announced it um we haven't seen the actual you know results yet or you know the if he's done the fundraising and all that um i honestly don't think crypto is going to be that big an issue for most voters right there's a lot of stuff happening right now in the u.s that I think it's probably going to take precedence in terms of being a uh, you know, central campaign issue. We are seeing candidates for office talk about crypto in various forms. Ron DeSantis, the current governor of Florida who is running for president, uh, had this whole thing about CBDCs. Um, and he had a, a bill that he signed that he said banned CBDCs, even though A, there's no U.S. CBDC. B, the U.S. doesn't seem to be you know at the pro- you know, point of issuing a CBDC. And C, the bill doesn't actually do anything of the sort. That he said it would. We're seeing other candidates, uh, you know, yeah, like RFK say, Jr. like spoke at the Bitcoin conference in sure. Miami a few yeah, weeks RFK ago. Yeah, RFK Jr. Robert Kennedy uh, is another candidate who says he's pro Bitcoin. Uh, I think Vivek Ramamurthy has talked a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, so we're seeing this kind of as a campaign talking point right now, but. I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen any polling. I haven't seen any, uh, you know, evidence that this is actually a campaign issue. Um, and certainly nothing that says that it will be a campaign issue in 17 months, which is how long we have until the next election. Um, yeah. So I'm curious to see what this campaign looks like, but just based on everything that's happened so far, yeah, I, th- I think it's going to take a lot of work to make this something that voters care enough about that they treat it as, you know, an actual central campaign issue or voting issue. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that in just in the sense that I mean, if you look at who does crypto appeal most to, it's going to be people 18 to 29 years of age, um, you know, perhaps up to like 40, kind of the millennials. Uh, but the people who have the most money and the most kind of influence over politics are generally you know, people who are much older than that. Right. Um, and usually people who are like 18 to 29 or whatever, they're not like the voter turnout amongst these people isn't the highest. Whereas people like 65 plus are, that's, that's kind of, you know, they vote pretty religiously. Um, so yeah, I think I, I would agree with you for that reason. I, I think it's a bit like premature, um, especially if crypto is like, if the industry was just like ripping right now and we were doing great and we were all like making money, <laughs> Yeah. instead of losing money it might be a little different but uh in this case it's kind of like i feel like people have, have it just feels like people have kind of like moved on to the next thing you know uh yeah. you know it feels like we're going on we're ai now right we're pivoting or yeah. we're, you know we're just moving on to look like, at where vcs are putting their money now you know compared to last year crypto versus ai huge jump so yeah i absolutely agree i think people have you know other interests but also you know to your point about how this is a bear market again we've had a like the industry as a whole has had a pretty disastrous, let's call it 12 months, right? I think that is when uh, the first of the crypto lenders had to pause withdrawals was about a year ago, yeah, uh, a year ago this month. Year. Right. Um, not even including Luna. Luna was more than a year ago now. Yeah. It's been a pretty bad, you know, 12 or 13 months and the industry has not made any friends uh, in that time. So, um, you know, a lot of voters who might consider crypto probably got burned by it or have watched it collapse in, you know, flames. And so, yeah, is it going to be an issue important enough to change a vote? I have no idea, but <laughs> everything I've seen so far suggests no. Yeah, I, I, I would I, I was like, I wish that wasn't the case, but I, I would probably I would agree with that that statement. Um. Anyway, um, Antonio, any final thoughts or, or questions from your end? No, all good. I think that just, um, well, 
doing some comparison, I guess. It's, um, well, maybe in the US, what's going to um, hurt is the technology brain drain or something like that, rather than um, any specific use by the by the, the the retail users, right? So, yeah, that's just a, a thought here because in Brazil, what we are seeing, there's a, a CBDC coming out, a digital real program coming out. Everything's being tokenized. It. Um, stable coins are being discussed already. So it's it, it it's being being here in Brazil, seeing these two perspectives. And of course, this is also happening in other places around the world where we see um, regulatory bodies issuing frameworks for crypto already. So I think at the end of the day, this becomes an issue of industry in itself. And uh, well, kind of making the cake get bigger, growing it, so and people realizing its value um, so it can actually be implemented and, and get on um, as an infrastructure um, piece of the market, because that's what we are seeing here in Brazil. It's a, uh, it, it is becoming part of the national financial system to have a DLT, or it will become in the next five years or or so. So it's just a quick thought here from all of our talk, is that um, it is well not weird, but it's different to see Brazil having some kind of lead on some things, uh, <laughs> since we are this, since we sometimes sabotage ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I just hope um, our regulators well do a good work and don't use the CBDC and all what this technology allows to well try and control and do what we don't want them to do, basically. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good point to end on. I think is that in, in Brazil, like you're, I think we're at the point where, like some of these kind of you know real world use cases of of the technology, like we're gonna start actually seeing how this this stuff can work in kind of like a you know, like a non casino you know, uh, type of context, I guess. Whereas I think in the U.S., like now that everything is just kind of collapsed, like Nick, you're talking about the last you know year, so everything's just sort of like. You know, it's like the house, you know, the like that old kind of story about the house built on sand or whatever, the different, you know, kind of, you know, what, yeah. what kind of foundation do you have your house? And like all this stuff just blows over. And it's like, well, what kind of like real world use cases do we actually have that we can point to? And I think that's why one of the reasons why AI is take, kind of taken off so much is because there's like real stuff you can do with it. And with crypto, it's kind of like, it's like, well, we have remittances. But it's like that, that was the same yeah. talking point from like 2013. You know, like, first time I got pitched, pitched to write a story about Bitcoin it was 2013. They're talking about remittances. And it's like, wait a minute, we don't have anything else beyond that at this point. Yeah. So, and I think one thing I that, think that you know is kind of. Yeah, just one Sorry. quick insight from this is that, um, well, it's just like the banking system and how money works and everything. People don't know how the technology behind works, how money is created and so on. So like at the end of the day, it doesn't impact as much as um, logging in into chat GPT and ask them to do half of your work, for instance. Right. You know, one thing I just, you know, one terrible comparison that you can look to. Um, the first iPhone was announced in like early 2007. So about a year, if I'm getting my days right, about a year before we started hearing, you know, Bitcoin or the white paper, year and a half, whatever. Um, so basically, you know, Bitcoin is just a little bit about two years younger than the iPhone or I don't know when the first iPhone was actually released. So maybe just a year, but they're roughly the same age. People are saying, okay, well, the Bitcoin technology is still new. It's early. You know, we'll get the, you know, we'll figure out how to use blockchains or what, you know, all we can do with them as we could develop this. But smartphones have a really clear niche. It didn't take that long. So. Obviously, it's a terrible comparison. You know, one's kind of fundamentally changing the concept of money. The other one is, you know, changing how we communicate and interact with people. But if you're looking at how things develop, uh, you know, a lot of critics are saying, well, you know, it's been 14, 15 years almost for Bitcoin, and we're still not sure, you know, what we're doing with it. It's, you know, it's an argument that there are counter arguments to that, but it's you're getting into the as you said remittances the kind of you know vague exotic things that people like most people don't really care about 
Yeah, and I just felt like, like seeing, like as you, Lewis mentioned earlier, like seeing Gensler go on CNBC or, or whatever channel he was on and just talk about like, oh, we don't need crypto. We already have digital fiat. Like, what's the point of crypto? And it was kind of like, it's like, wait a minute. Are we like, <laughs> like have we not advanced beyond like this, you know, this like, right. yeah. like how are we still debating this? You know what I mean? Have we, like, are we, like, is there something just totally, are we doing something just totally wrong where we can't even convince people that like this thing is like worthy of existing? Um but anyway, maybe, you know, maybe not a very optimistic point to end on. But um, but look, I think I think, you know, the good news is that like, you know, it's a it doesn't seem like this is like an exist like all these lawsuits, all this SEC action. This is, doesn't seem like it's like an existential thing for the industry. It's going to cause a lot of pain. But like we're still here. Uh, things are still working. Um, you know, it seems like like it'll take a few years for all this stuff kind of works yeah, its way the through the courts. Continues. Yeah, the blockchain continues to produce blocks, so everything's going yeah. To just well. it's just a pe- it, it, it'll continue to produce, produce block. The question is just like, is anybody going to be using them? Uh, or yeah. but it'll continue to produce blocks. Um, but anyway, Nick would love to um, you know if you want to just you know final thoughts from you, and you know if, if folks want to get in touch with you for anything, um, like what's the best way to reach you, and um, or like what what are you what would you be interested in like you know hearing from people about if uh, if, if folks want to reach you. Yeah, no, um, I'm on, you know, Twitter or email, probably the best way to get uh, at me. Um, my email is just nik at coindesk.com. My Twitter, do you have like a description box or something you can just post? That yeah, in? I can just drop all the stuff in there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, my phone, my Twitter is my full name. Uh, so at N-I-K-H-I-L-E-S-H-D-E. Um, feel free to hit me up anytime. Uh, you know, as far as what I'm interested in hearing about, a lot of what I do now is focused mostly on legislation and lawsuits, but... I do, you know, I am part of a team of reporters who are covering crypto regulations worldwide. So we have reporters in, you know, India, Hong Kong, Italy, Brussels, uh, Belgium, uh, you know, London in the UK. So we have reporters all over. We're trying to figure out just how this regulatory, you know, regimes around the world are developing, what lawmakers are looking at, how they're engaging with the crypto industry, how regulators are engaging, how the crypto industry is trying to engage with the regulators. So uh, you know, if that's something you're working on or part of, feel free to hit me up. We are always looking to get a better sense of what's happening and what's, you know, driving the uh, legislative and regulatory efforts. So we'd love to hear from your audience about, uh, you know, those issues and what they're seeing or how they're interacting. Awesome. Um, well, great. Well, Nick, thanks so much for your time. It's great having you here. And uh, Antonio, thanks for coming back. Uh, great having you back here as well. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks for having me.